So what I'd like to do now <clears throat> is introduce our second speaker for the day, Alistair Walshaw from Case New Holland. Alistair's current role for CNH is open innovation, and that's within the Advanced Technology Group. He is responsible for identifying external collaboration opportunities to complement any and all of the CNH industrial group sectors. Alistair is from a farming background. He graduated from Harper Adams University before gaining an MSc from Cranfield. Alistair started his career with Bayer Agrochemicals in the product development arena, working on application methods for new agrochemicals. Following this, he joined Ford Tractors, one of the precursor companies of CNH Industrial. And as an international demonstrator and product support specialist, he has worked in many countries around the world. He has since held numerous regional and global positions in both the commercial and product development sectors. Most recently, he has been focusing on off-highway emissions legislation and its implementation and sustainable alternative fuels. Alistair is a long-standing uh, member of IAGRI and has been since his university days. Alistair's presentation today will give you an insight into New Holland's new T6 methane tractor and how it supports a carbon neutral farming cycle. Over to you, Alistair. Thank you, Charlie. And uh, <clears throat> I have to say thank you to Paul earlier on for the uh, reminding me that it's been 40 years since I've been at Harper Adams. It was a, a, bit of, a bit of a kick to the stomach. I didn't think I was that old, but obviously I am. Um, right. OK, so before we start into the tractor part of things, I just wanted to a uh, little bit of revision, if you like, and a reminder of who CNH Industrial are. So let's uh, just get on the right part. So we are probably the biggest company that most people have never heard of. Um, we're one of the largest and most geographically diverse industrial capital goods companies on the planet. Uh, we're the company behind 12 commercial brands. We employ 60, over 64,000 people and we operate in almost every market in the world. If we take a closer look at things that people may recognize, we are the second largest manufacturer of agricultural machinery and we trade under three brands. Uh, we are a global player in the construction equipment business and operating under two brands. We are the market leaders in alternative fuels in the commercial and specialty vehicle sector, operating under six brands, including Iveco trucks and the Magoris firefighting vehicles. We have a powertrain division, and of course we have financial services to support our customers and dealers. Our main center of operation is in, in the UK is based in Basildon. This was originally built by Ford Motor Company back in 1964 and continues today nearly 60 years on as a manufacturing center for the iconic blue tractors that we all know and love. While the externals of the main building have remained very similar, internally things are quite different. The production systems, the technology and the size of the vehicles being produced have changed considerably. In, the, in these days of sustainability, it's actually quite interesting to note how the consumables have reduced. The paint and oil reductions in the order of 75% and 97% respectively. Obviously, there are some new additions, such as air conditioning fluid, which did not have much of a demand in 1964. Sustainability is something that CNH industry have taken very seriously for many years now. We've been the industry leader in the Dow Jones sustainability world and European indices for the last 10 consecutive years. We're also an A-list company in the CDP climate change program. So this is something that CNH progressively we push every year. So what are the main driver, market drivers for an alternative fueled off-highway off vehicle? Is it something CNH just decided we wanted to do, or is there something more behind it? Well, for us, the main driver in this project, as always, was a, is our customer. On the one hand, the customers are looking for ways to optimize their profit margins by reducing the operating costs, either in daily operation, um, cutting down on inputs, fuels, fertilizers, et cetera and also reducing the cost of ownership of the, of the equipment they run. At the same time, however, they are in, in facing increasing demands for using equipment with smaller carbon footprints. 
This can be driven by corporate businesses like supermarkets passing greenhouse gas emission targets down to, down to them, municipalities setting sustainability targets, uh, and qualifying for funding link, linked to environmental projects. Finally, there is also potential of legislation or political pressure, legislation aiming at carbon neutrality and methane reduction, which obviously has really hit the headlines as recently as yesterday uh, at COP26. As the market was evolving this direction, New Holland, um, at New Holland, we explored how renewable fuels and low emission technologies could help our customers. The story of the T6180 methane power really originates right back at 2006, when as New Holland, we introduced our clean energy leader strategy. In 2007, we were the first to support 100% biodiesel on all our tractors. In 2009, we unveiled the, the NH2 hydrogen concept, and we presented the energy independent farm vision. Our work on the NH2 project made it very clear that this technology was far from being financially viable. But the early concept of the energy independent farm was something that struck a chord with our customers. They wanted a solution in the short term. They didn't want to wait for the hydrogen technology to mature. Within the NH2 project, we'd also considered the use of methane from biogas plants, and our customers liked the idea of using biomethane to power the tractors. <clears throat> so the story continues, and in 2013, we showed the first generation of a T16, a T6 methane powered tractor. Many of the parts for that vehicle were actually coming from the parts bin of our on highway Iveco cousins. In 2015, we showed the new and improved second generation methane tractor. And then we started the industrialization of the product in 2017 with some support from the UK government's advanced propulsion center. The culmination of this work is the commercial production um, in Basildon will start next month. When it comes to alternative fuels, CNH, we believe that the final solution for the off-highway and agricultural sectors will not be a one-size-fits-all solution. At the right time, there will be a place for both hydrogen and electric applications. However, we believe that today methane, in particular fugitive, fugitive methane, produced from animal waste is a real solution that enables a tangible, economic and sustainable solution to the sectors. Our hydrogen interest has not gone away, but both the vehicle technology and the market infrastructure is still very immature. Likewise, pure electric vehicles have many challenges today. However, the use of electrification does show some potential of interesting benefits. Taking a closer look at methane tractor development, as CNH, we've had the benefit of over 20 years of in-house expertise and learning from our Iveco cousins. They started in 1996 with buses and trucks, and today they run vehicles of up to 460 horsepower on pure methane engines. Using group experience is one of the key traits of CNH Industrial. So we look to transfer this technology know-how from the on-road sector to the off-road sector. So what did our agricultural customers actually want? Well, the vehicle requirement document was actually very simple. They basically said everything had to be the same as the diesel product with the exception that they wanted the running cost to be 30% less. And then of course they threw in the extra little bit that they wanted sustainability credentials, which had to be significantly better. Uh, nobody could actually put a, a value on this, but they just said it just has to be a lot better than it is today. So there's a number of bits we had to change. Obviously, the key part was the engine. Um, for the, en the aim for the engine, however, was quite simple. We just want to maximize the commonality with the stage five diesel that is already a well-proven unit for off-highway vehicles. There was probably slightly more changes than we first intended um, with the engine. Um, and as often the case, when you start with these th things, true carryover components end up being very rare um, and certainly a lot less than we'd hoped for. But at least they were the big bits, like the sump, the block and the crankshaft. What we've ended up with is we believe the latest state-of-the-art single fuel engine. It's been specially developed to use methane. It's not a, it's not a diesel that's been a, been a convert. Uh, it has a proprietary model-based engine controller that gives a high performance with very low emissions, very low noise, and very low vibration. 
Next day is to go with this engine. We need to develop a new exhaust and after treatment system. This enables us to delete the quite complicated stage five diesel arrangement of SCRs, PM filters, and add blue dosing systems with a much simpler three-way catalyst and a small muffler arrangement. As can be seen in these layouts, <coughs> there are a lot less parts and no, a lot less parts required, and there's actually no moving parts in the system. However, one issue we did have to address was the extra exhaust heat that was created in this type of engine. <clears throat> in some applications, we have seen temperatures in excess of 750 degrees centigrade. This compares with a max temperature in a diesel exhaust system of around 550. This has proved a real challenge for the heat management engineers, but using technology common with our cousins in the red F1 and supercar arena, we have successfully achieved the same legal requirement maximum touch with maximum touch temperatures of 8 degrees centigrade, which is essential when you recognise the exposed position of exhaust stacks common on most agricultural tractors. So the final vehicle challenge was really how do we get the required fuel quantity stored on the vehicle? This actually is quite a common challenge of all alternative fuels, and it's, and it's probably no accident that the current fossil fuels have a good balance between fuel, the fuel's energy by mass and by volume. As can be seen in this chart, batteries have challenges in both areas. While hydrogen excels on the energy mass basis, but it's not so clever on, on the by volume basis. Even when you overcome the challenges of, comp of compressing to 700 bars or liquefying at minus 253 degrees centigrade. So the challenge with methane is as a compressed gas, you need roughly five liters of CNG to every one liter of diesel. So for our 150 liter diesel tank, we needed to find storage for 750 liters of gas. As an example, I would need 20 CNG tanks of approximately 300 millimeters diameter and about one meter long. If I chose a slightly sort of easier path, inverted commas, of LNG, my storage is less challenging. In that I now only need 270 litres. But even then, the LNG tank shown here is 600 millimetres in diameter and around two metres along. Both of these represent quite a challenge for packaging on an agricultural tractor. The other not insignificant issue with LNG route is if you do not manage the temperature of the LNG within the tank, then for safe, safety, the tank will vent to avoid dangerous pressure buildup. This venting in combined spaces could cause a direct safety risk. And of course, leaking methane to the environment is not good on the carbon footprint credentials. Considering the challenge of LNG tank design and the potential for this uh, venting, the decision was made to follow the, the compressed gas route. And we considered a number of solutions for storage options. Unfortunately, while there are a number of interesting possibilities at the at the stage, at this stage, the standard common compressed cylinders were the best compromise. The final solution that we have gone for is a naval on vehicle storage of 190 litres with an additional 270 litres on a range extender. While this 460 litres is, we recognise, is some, some way short of the ideal target of 750, it does enable a full day's work in lighter duties like hedge cutting and more than half a day's work in heavy, heavy heavy applications, allowing for a quick refill at lunchtime. This is proving very acceptable to the customer base that we have been testing the vehicles with. So we now have what we believe is the tractor the customers have been asking for.
So we have a tractor, but let's not forget one of the customer's drivers for this T6180 methane powered project was great sustainability credentials. And with this tractor, we believe we've changed the game. On the left, you see the history of the impact of emission legislation, and you see the great and substantial progress has been made on diesel products in reducing NOx and PM since 1996. On the right, you see the T1680 methane powered compared with these latest stage five requirements. We have a 98% less uh, particulate matter, we have 90% less hydrocarbons, we have 75% less carbon monoxide, 62% less NOx, and on top of that, we have 11% reduction in the CO2, which is not actually mandated currently by stage five legislation. So from a vehicle point of view, we think we've done very well. However, of course, that's not the full picture. Vehicle emissions, tank to wheel as it's often called, is only half or less than the, or less of the full emissions impact. The source of the fuel is a major contributor, so it's really key to understand what the, oh, sorry, it's really key to understand the whole impact of alternative fuel is from well to wheel. The chart on the right shows the well to wheel greenhouse gas impact of various fuels. If we look at producing biomethane from municipal waste and biomass, <clears throat> this has a carbon reduction factor of around 80% when compared to diesel. But if we target biomethane production from animal slurry and from farm waste, then we're capturing, capturing what's known as fugitive methane, that is naturally occurring methane from biological processes. And this has a very strong negative impact on the CO2 with reductions of over 180% compared to diesel. So where can we get the fuel from like this? Well, there's about 18,000 biogas plants around Europe that have been put up um, to produce biogas. Uh, a lot of those have been incentively driven and they are also, they're obviously a good initial source for us. However, <clears throat> probably more interesting to us, there is 140,000 dairy farms in Europe with herds of 50 cows or more. Um, just to ask why, why may I say 50 cows or more? Because our indications are that if you've got 50 cows, you've got enough, enough uh, tractors or enough methane from the those cows to run our tractor for a year. Now, interesting enough, if you look at these maps here, the map on the left shows the methane hotspots in, in the UK. Now, we could assume that this distribution that we're seeing, where all the yellow parts are, is because all the national, the national grid leaks occur in these areas. But when we look at where the dairy and pig hotspots in the UK are, we find there's a good correlation of the area's high methane and livestock rearing. So this is the fugitive methane that's available to us. So this now brings us back to the CNH vision of 2009 in the energy independent farm. But now in 2021, we believe that this is becoming a, re a reality. All we have to do is just capture the natural fugitive methane from the animals. So how hard can that be? Well, a quick, quick Google search indicates there are a number of engineering solutions as to how to best capture this fugitive methane from Daisy and Gertrude. However, we've chosen a partner with a, to partner with a small UK company called Benjamin, who in the session after the coffee break will share with you what I think you will see as more practical and engineering solution to capturing this methane. And thank you very much. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much for that, Alistair. Really, really interesting. Uh, lots of questions. Um, we've got 10 or so minutes. Um, if I can just filter them out. So the first question um, is quite a controversial one from Ken Pollock. If the law says I can't burn natural gas in my boiler, why should you think you can use it in a tractor? Uh, well, I, I didn't know you couldn't burn natural gas in the boiler at the moment, but uh, if, if it gets to that, that point, um, why? Because I'm using, I'm capturing natural. The intention is to capture natural gas from animals, which is this fugitive methane, which is there anyway. And it's uh, uh, even if you don't happen to have cows, if you cut your grass at the weekend and and put your grass in in a bin liner, uh, by by the end of the following week, you will have a bag full of methane 
that's, that's been collected. So there, methane is all around us. Um, yes, as man-made, we, we make it and we dig it out of the ground, but we're, we're not suggesting digging out of the ground. And, and in actual fact, the, the research we've done says that there are very few customers in, in the world that will actually want to put fossil methane into our vehicle because it's not financially viable to them. Okay, thank you. Um, so quest next question from Andrew Cragg. Uh, landfill companies use methane powered generation while the reliability of these engines is compromised by the quality of gas resulting in short service life, especially with valves. Do you have a solution to this issue? Uh, we, we have a potential solution to this issue that we're looking at in that uh, Certainly the easy gas and most of the biodigesters, to be fair, the 18,000 biodigesters in Europe, um, out of those, most of them are feeding these uh, uh, low efficient engines to, to provide the combined heat and power activity. Not many are, are cleaning the gas and putting the gas into the gas grid. Um, we, we need clean gas or clean gas to put into the, the, our engines. Um, so something that's got 85% um, or more methane, uh, and it it can be done. I'll say the, the the presenters coming next will will give you some ideas of uh, of how we believe it can be done at an economic level, not at the the massive industrial scale that uh, that is is normally common. Um, just off the back of that. Um reliability question if i just jump to chris biddle's question what if any are the servicing and repair challenges for dealers on methane tractors uh we we don't see there are any the service the the the, uh, the service um intervals that we're looking at with our tractor our gas tractor is exactly the same as the diesel uh, tractor the the principles of the engine are the same so we are doing very we, we are doing obviously um, specific dealer training to, to manage the gas, but it's really just managing a new fuel, a, a new liquid, if you like. It's not quite a liquid, obviously it's a, it's a gas, but it's it's a little bit like the introduction of AdBlue 10 years ago when uh, when emissions legislation started. It's yes, it's something new for the dealers to manage, but it's it's certainly well within their capabilities and we're not asking them to uh, sort of totally change their systems completely. and. And that's that's what we see as one of the key advantages in that uh, this is a progressive um, introduction for both the dealers and the farmers. We're not uh, we're not trying to change the whole world in one go. OK, uh, and if I just sneak a question in off the back of that um, with the you mentioned the range extender that you, you fit on the front. Is that something that's easily swappable? I could have could a farmer have two of those uh, if he was working remotely. If you, uh, and swap them over or a, a farmer could have two of those and swap them over um but what's um in the discussions that we've had with various farmers uh, uh, that we've been testing the vehicles with and in 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 the uk and other countries um obviously as we don't all know farmers are quite inventive in their own ways and they're, they're seeing other opportunities to uh, extend their ranges that that we um, we technically as as, uh, as responsible manufacturers can't condone, but um, obviously may happen <laughs> going forward. <laughs> Homemade Bowser's. <laughs> oh, I can't possibly say. <laughs> uh, so I've got a question from Brian Matthew. I do apologise if I don't do it justice because it's quite a long question. Um, he says, interesting presentation, but is this just not tinkering around the edges while Rome burns? A CO2 is still being produced. His question is about how synthetic fuels made from CO2 in the atmosphere and renewable energy. This is now being considered for aircraft fuel. One has to ask why not for agricultural vehicles or indeed the rest of the internal combustion engine power transport <laughs> fleet. Uh, from what I can see, is it down to scale? If it is done at a big enough scale, then the price will come down to make it affordable. Given that this is now a climate emergency, surely this is something governments and industry can embrace. So really a question about the CO2 and the synthetic fuels. 
I think I think CO2 CO2 is obviously very important, but I think what we've got to miss and what's been picked up at COP26 yesterday is that methane is is more of an immediate impact in that we can uh, CO2 stays around in the atmosphere for 100 years and everything's been quoted on this 100 year scenario. Uh, if you look at the methane scenario, depending on on a 100 year basis, it's as someone's put in the chat already, it's about 26. But if you put uh, if you put it in the in the 20 year period, it's it's an 86 times multiplier. Um, and so methane is something we need to address quickly because otherwise we may not be around in 100 years to worry about the 100 year period. So we we need to address the, the near term. Um, and again, if we use if we look at using the fugitive methane that is produced by cows and rotting veg, vegetation, um, then we are capturing methane that's going to go to the atmosphere anyway. So if we um, it's we're not promoting at the moment um, zero emissions at the point of use. But again, we've got to look at the whole well to wheel scenario and not just the emissions produced by the vehicle burning the fuel. Um, that's that's an area that is critically important. Uh, and and without if, if we if we just look at hydrogen, hydrogen, everyone is saying is a great scenario. But uh, as we all know, finding hydrogen fuel, fuel station on the highway at the moment is almost an impossibility in very few areas. Can you find that? When is when is hydrogen going to be readily, readily available on a farm? Um, we are many years away from that, I believe. So so this is a solution that's here today. As I say, many companies are talking about solutions, but we have a solution that you can buy literally in the next six weeks. Okay, thank you. Uh, Will Chua has an interesting question, but I think we'll leave that for when we have the discussion about methane production on the farm, because I think that will probably get covered then. Uh, just jumping down to Toby Watley's question, uh, what is your predicted quantity demand for the tractor? In the next three years, so the production volumes estimations. Um, <clears throat> uh, difficult. <clears throat> I, I don't really want to say that in real terms, but it's a lot. It's a lot more now than it was when we started the program. Um, I, I think the the interest and the enthusiasm that we are now picking up from from customers is um, when we started. You can say it was the it was the the opinion leaders, the market uh, creators were were interested. Um, now it's become a lot more widespread, and we're getting a lot more interest from from customers and, and real customers that want to want to have a demonstration, want to understand the costs and and how it fits in with their farm. So um, I I think it's it's an area that we we thought was if you like it was an innovation activity like all big companies put a innovation thing on a stand and then don't do anything with it we've now produced a tractor and uh, and there, there's plans to to increase the range going forward now so it's it's very encouraging okay uh, there, there are a few questions around costs um which could probably be joined together a little bit so um, both from Tim and Dave Price. Um, energy cost of the new engine and gas storage compared with fossil fuel equivalents, positive or negative? And also, how does the cost of multiple gas tanks compare to a simple diesel tank? And, and I guess with that question, it really should be looked at a whole system cost, you know, in terms of the stuff you're taking off the tractor and the stuff you're fitting on the tractor. So some yeah. interesting questions around cost. Yeah, the, the, the cost is... Certainly, the cost at the moment is is a lot more than we'd we'd hoped for. Um, we when we started the activity, a lot of it has come really because, of course, even on the engine changes, the the volume we we don't get a volume benefit uh, on the on the activity. Um, diesel engines, we like everybody else, are producing sort of hundreds of thousands of diesel engines, and the components are readily available. Um, the for for the for the gas engine at the moment we are along with our Iveco cousins we are about the the only ones doing it in any volume um, and the volumes are much reduced so so the engine cost is more the uh, the the tank systems are very much the same uh, and obviously we know that uh, 
most fuel diesel fuel tanks now are, are plastic so not environmentally friendly anyway but they're they're easy and cheap to make um whereas the, the tanks we're using on the tractor are, are steel so whether they're more environmentally friendly they're certainly easier to recycle but um but they they're costing more at the moment as well but uh, uh, things are, are changing on the tank side in general. Sort of, we say it's within this program. We looked at many tank solutions, and um, and with hydrogen coming on, there's more tank solutions, or high pressure tank solutions coming through, which we we can look at in the future. So, it's it's looking good there from the cost of, total cost of the vehicle point of view. There is an increased cost over the diesel vehicle, but uh, but. When you look at the whole package that we can now offer um, with uh, from the fuel supply uh, and the vehicle, the total cost of ownership is very comparable um, with with a diesel vehicle. Um, and the sustainability credentials are there are then adding on top of that. And this is probably something we certainly at the start of the program we didn't uh, evaluate correctly, but the sustainability value is is very important even though it's not necessarily a financial tangible thing at the moment many of our customers are saying it's really critical to their business so okay uh, yeah tim tim was clarifying to me about he's talking about the energy cost as opposed to the monetary cost the energy cost yeah. in what way sorry i'm not oh. um tim do you want to unmute if you, if you want to clarify yeah, can you hear me all right? Yeah. 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 I mean, we're talking about you know, sustainable energy and replacing energy sources. So the question really is about well, what's the energy input to produce this vehicle, this engine and, and, and tractor? Is it actually less or more than existing tractors? It's probably rather oh, a different okay. one to answer. But okay. um, all right, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, it's clear now. No, the the energy input is, I, I would have to say, from the, the actual producing the hardware of the tractor is very similar because most of the tractor is is the same. Um, the, the key critical change will be the, the tanks. And as I indicated, obviously, on this tractor, we're in metal. And on, the, on a diesel tractor, we have a, a lot more plastic um, in the tank area. So I would say overall, it's 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 pretty similar maybe the odd percentage gain here or there but it's it's going to be pretty similar the the diff the differences will be explained in the next session is um taking the fugitive methane will give a big carbon negative which uh, will then uh, help to balance out the, the total overall um footprint okay thanks for that um i mean from an oe manufacturer's perspective i think we would frighten ourselves now if we look back from when we started at tier tier one tier two um and you look at the cost of an installed stage five engine you know i can remember telling a, a boss of mine several years ago that the engine cost is probably going to double you know as we go through these these emissions uh, levels and it's probably far more than double when you look at it what an engine cost back in pre-tier days, you know, versus what a stage five engine of equivalent horsepower costs. It's phenomenally expensive with all the equipment and complexity that's on there. So, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. The cost, it's the cost of the engine and the cost of the after treatment to clean it all. If you include the, the after treatment exhaust system in, it, the costs become quite eye-watering. But, yeah. but uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, when we obviously, as said in the presentation, we are, as a company, we we haven't uh, discarded the hydrogen activity at the moment, but when you compare even the current costs of, of the, the ICE engine and, uh, and the after treatment with, with hydrogen, the hydrogen is still very sort of uh, immature. It needs to be a lot closer than it is. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, we're about 20 past uh, 11, so we're gonna have a, a 10 minute break now. Thank you, Alistair, absolutely fascinating presentation it's going to be great to, to see some of these tractors out working um i know you've got a number of them around the globe 